There is an unknown world on Earth, a world which few have ever encountered. Human beings have conquered the highest mountains, explored and exploited the world's rainforests, and walked across miles of baking desert. Yet most of us know next to nothing about a wilderness each one of us has in common, a landscape that contains all the variety of the continents and oceans on Earth. There is more wildlife here than in an African game park. Its forests provide food and shelter for a multitude of amazing creatures, each one making the most of this unique landscape. Here is a diverse assortment writers of science fiction might envy. Some have moved in beneath the surface, making the most of the warmth and safety of subterranean passageways. These landscapes exist in a multitude of shapes, sizes and colours, and their denizens offer a strange beauty that often belies their deadly intentions. It is the human body, and its wildlife is eating us alive. The Dogon region of Mali in West Africa, an area renowned for its rugged beauty. The people are proud and live a life steeped in history and tradition. Water is at a premium here. It sustains the people and their parasites. But clean water is an even rarer commodity in Mali. Outside the rainy season, people must rely on pools for their drinking water. Often a focal point for the community, the water quality here is hardly ideal. But it's perfect for water fleas. Harmless in themselves, these little cyclops play a vital role in the life of one of the parasites that preys on us. This parasite is the guinea worm. Many people in West Africa work on the land. It's a hard physical life made even harder by the guinea worm. It starts life in the water as a microscopic creature. It's eaten by the cyclops, which in turn are swallowed by people in their drinking water. Inside the human body, the young worms mature, ending up living just under the skin where they produce thousands of young. There is a flaw in its life cycle. The worm forms a blister on the victim's skin. When the foot enters water, the worm pushes through the blister to release its microscopic babies before retreating again. Pouring water over the blister fools the guinea worm into coming out. It can then be caught. For many years, people in Africa treated this infection themselves, but these days professional help is on hand. The mature guinea worm is the largest round worm that lives in humans. Some females can grow to over a meter. They live for years and produce literally millions of offspring. Once the lower part of the worm is exposed, the rest can be teased out. but only very slowly. Some of the longer worms can take days to extract, a few centimeters at a time, while taking care not to break the worm, as any parts left behind can lead to very nasty infections. When a good length has been pulled out, and to make sure it can't escape back into the leg, the worm is wrapped around a stick. This keeps it secure, and helps in pulling the rest out.
It's an ancient technique, but with the addition of a little modern disinfectant, still an effective one. Removing a worm is no guarantee against further attacks, nor is it a cure for the inflammation and tissue damage already caused. In a few days, the dressing can be changed and a little more of the worm wound onto the stick. The good news is that the guinea worm is not the problem it once was. The affliction has nearly been eradicated and may well disappear over the next few years. The most potent measure against the worm has been the use of these water filters the people make and use, which separate the cyclops from the drinking water, preventing further infection. A simple technique. we offer an irresistible mix of shelter, food and safety to the myriad animals that have chosen to make us their home. Old and young, rich and poor, black and white, it really doesn't matter to our parasites. Some have chosen to live on the surface, in the human forest. Their small flattened bodies and powerful pincer claws are perfect adaptations for hanging on in their chosen habitat. Head lice live in our hair, traversing the tangled trapeze on our heads, which offers security and a place to lay eggs while feeding on our blood. But many things in our modern lifestyle make life difficult for our parasites. We go to considerable lengths to keep clean. But we assume that because we regularly take a shower or linger in hot baths, that parasites must be other people's problems. We pay special attention to our skin, especially the face. Making sure to keep it looking its best with aftershave, lipstick and eyeliner. Your face is probably the last place you'd expect to find a parasite. After all, you study it in detail every day. Surely nothing could live there without you knowing about it. Look closely at the follicles, the canals from where your eyelashes grow. Look closer still, and you might see another face looking back at you. This is the follicle mite. They live in groups of nine or ten, males and females together, breeding and laying eggs right there under your eyelashes. Trying to get rid of them would cause more problems than the relatively harmless mites ever do. And don't think you could never have them. Nine out of ten of us do. However, not all parasites are as friendly as the follicle mite. One of them was responsible for the deaths of millions of people. It changed the course of European history as it spread the plague. It was widely believed that black rats were the culprits. In fact, it was their fleas that carried the deadly bacteria. As rats died, the fleas often found another food source, human blood, and thus brought the Black Death to us. Fleas have fascinated people for centuries. Flea circuses were very popular during the 19th and early 20th century. Even the aristocracy would line up to see them perform. Circus masters claimed royal patronage and made a fortune from their pinhead-sized performers. Some museums keep exhibits of dressed fleas. These were made in Mexico as popular souvenirs for tourists. The fleas were dressed as Mexican musicians or wedding parties. You can still find fleas at the Munich Beer Festival in Germany. 
There are flea circuses elsewhere, but this one claims to be the last one in Europe and performs here every year. The fleas are tethered to thin strands of copper wire and perform much the same tricks as their ancestors did. Some of them play football, kicking little polystyrene balls into the net under the careful aim of the circus master. To train the fleas, he keeps them in a small enclosed box for about three weeks before the show until they learn that jumping gets them nowhere. They soon stop and become more tractable. The fleas also get a chance to demonstrate their strength by pulling carts and chariots. Some of these carts are a hundred years old and made of gold. They were crafted especially for the purpose by jewelers. The circus master keeps about 200 fleas at any one time. These are mainly human, cat and hedgehog fleas which he feeds on his own blood. Fleas, with their flat bodies, can move easily between our hairs. They breathe through holes in their sides. Their hearts are in their backs, and they have the most elaborate sexual apparatus of any animal. They lay up to 13 eggs a day in our hair after feeding on blood. The eggs hatch after a few days into larvae, flea maggots, that feed on dead skin and debris, including some of the undigested blood excreted by their parents. They also thrive on our pets. A family cat or dog can be a haven for a whole host of fleas. Once they've hitched a ride into our homes on the four-legged members of the family, heated rooms and deep pile carpets make the ideal nursery for this upwardly mobile creature. Americans spend one billion dollars a year trying to control them. To get around, fleas jump. They launch themselves at 20 times the acceleration of an Apollo moon rocket. The force on the body is equal to a man crashing a car into a wall at 300 kilometers per hour. Nevertheless, however well adapted a parasite may be, life is fraught with danger. We humans have techniques that make a parasite's life difficult. But some of our tenants have come up with an answer to all that discomfort. They've moved in literally, and live inside us. Life in the interior world of the human landscape can be very comfortable, if you can get there. The seething acid bath of the human stomach awaits any parasite that has managed to survive its journey past our cutting and crushing teeth. If a parasite can make it through the digestive process and survive long enough to pass through the duodenum, then life gets a lot better as it enters the intestine, a convoluted channel where it will find all the food and shelter it desires. The parasite strategies for getting to this position of luxury are many and varied, but they work. Nearly every living thing on Earth has its parasites, even fish that live in the harsh salt water environment of the sea. Few of these parasites are a problem to human beings. Most only affect the particular species of fish in which they're found. These days, the practice of gutting and freezing the fish at sea has largely eliminated any problems caused by parasites, killing and removing them long before the fish are landed. However, in recent years, traditional foods from various countries have spread around the world, offering people a new choice of meals and, in some cases, new problems. 
Sushi is raw fish eaten with a variety of vegetables and dressings. In America and Europe, sushi causes few problems because only frozen fish is used, and freezing or cooking kills the parasites. However, in some parts of the world, sushi is eaten using fresh fish that's not been frozen or treated in any way. In the Far East, one type of roundworm regularly finds its way out of the fish and into the human stomach, where it can cause a lot of problems. This is the Anisakis worm, a roundworm that lives in the muscles of fish. No more than a few centimeters long, it invades the human stomach, burrowing into the stomach wall and causing a searing, stabbing pain. The best answer to the problem of an Anisakis worm is to remove it quickly. The endoscope reveals the intricate details of the esophagus, the tube that takes our food from our mouth to the stomach. Once inside the stomach, the doctor can begin to search the many convolutions of the stomach wall for the culprit. It doesn't take long. The red inflamed patch shows where the worm has attached itself. Careful manipulation of the forceps at the end of the endoscope soon removes the offending squatter. Sometimes X-rays reveal much larger worms living in our intestines, like Ascaris, a big cousin of the little Anisakis worm. Some of the parasites that live inside us are seriously big. These Ascaris worms are between 25 to 35 centimeters long. Heavy infections can block the intestine or cause lung disease. As many as 5,000 have been removed from a single person. But the truly remarkable thing about Ascaris is its ability to reproduce. One Ascaris worm can produce up to 200,000 eggs every day of her adult life. That's about 26 million eggs in her lifetime. Laying large numbers of eggs or giving birth to a multitude of offspring are two options for ensuring survival of the species. Today, 25% of the world population is infected with Ascaris. In Europe and America, wherever dogs are used to work sheep, another kind of worm has claimed its territory. The disease is found today in Wales, in the UK, in several American states and other countries around the world. Hydatid disease is caused by a small tapeworm that infects dogs. The worm spends a part of its life cycle in sheep and spreads to dogs when they eat dead sheep out on the hills. With the boom in sheep farming in recent years, the parasite hasn't had any difficulty finding the intermediate hosts it needs to survive and flourish. We get the disease from dogs that have picked up the worm. The parasite matures inside the dog, and its eggs are excreted when the dog defecates. The eggs are passed to us when we pet the dogs or allow them to lick our faces. The disease is serious enough for children from farming communities to be taught about the worms and how to avoid them. The hydatid tapeworm is very small in comparison to many of its relatives, so small that it looks harmless and innocent. We are an accidental host to the hydatid tapeworm, but we serve its purpose well. Unfortunately, it can flourish as efficiently inside us as it can inside a sheep's body, and the results are devastating. This amateur video, shot by a surgical team, shows the extent of the problem. The worms form huge cysts full of fluid and tiny offspring. The cysts can occur in the lungs or the liver and must be removed with caution. If the cysts rupture, Millions of the tiny worms are released. Sheep also host bigger tapeworms. These flatworms are some of the largest parasites in the world. 
Some beef tapeworms have reached 23 meters in length. They can be made up of more than a thousand segments. Each segment has its own male and female reproductive organs and can therefore self-fertilize the 80,000 eggs contained in each one. A human host infected with one of these worms, which can live up to 25 years, could excrete up to 720,000 eggs every day. The beauty of an animal's habitat is no guarantee against parasites. Wild freshwater fish live in some very picturesque streams and lakes, yet they can harbor the juvenile stage of a massive human tapeworm. The tapeworm was very common in the American Great Lakes at one time and would regularly infect people who were careless when preparing and cooking fish. It's still around today. Several people were infected in Los Angeles only a few years ago. Once inside a human host, the juvenile can double its length every day for two weeks. Many worms grow to a length of one to two meters in that period, but can reach 10 or even 15 meters. The worms are long lived, and it's quite common for more than one worm to be present at one time. While the fish may seem quite unconcerned, those of us who enjoy catching our own supper should make very sure that it's well cooked before we eat it. Our domestic animals are often host to a very different kind of flatworm. They cost farmers a fortune and can cost us our health. This type of flatworm causes havoc to humans around the world. Flukes come in many shapes and sizes. Some, like this liver fluke, are very adaptable and have been found in the livers of nine different mammalian species, including humans. Most flukes live in the cavities and canals of our internal organs. However, one species has evolved to live in the blood attached to the veins in various parts of our bodies. The males and females live in a lifelong embrace and cause havoc out of all proportion to their size. This is schistosoma, which even today affects 200 million people around the world. The flukes are found in countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, West Africa and the Nile Delta. They're also common in the Philippines and many Caribbean islands. It's the sort of souvenir you don't want to bring back from your holidays. Schistosomes have separate sexes, which is unusual for flukes. The male is about a couple of centimeters long and the sides of its body roll in to form a groove in which the female lies enclosed. They have access to everything that flukes need. Plenty of oxygen in the blood and all the food they can eat in the blood cells and vein walls that surround them. Here they breed. The female produces 3,500 eggs a day. The eggs migrate to the bladder and end up in rivers and lakes when people urinate. They hatch, and the next stage in the fluke's life cycle can begin. The immature fluke must now find a particular species of freshwater snail in which to develop into the next stage of its life cycle. The snails emit a chemical that attracts the young flukes. Without the snails, the flukes would never develop into mature worms. They burrow through the snail's skin. Once inside, each fluke starts to form long sacs that give rise to another 250,000 individuals. These individuals, now in the next stage of development, break out of the sac and burrow out of the snail in waves and into the water where timing now becomes critical. They must find a human host within hours or die.
Any person coming into contact with the fluke during this time will be at risk. Fishermen, children playing, women washing, all are in danger of infection. But not from swallowing the water. The juvenile flukes swim around frantically searching for their next host. attracted to human skin. They release powerful chemicals that attack and dissolve it. After struggling through the tough outer layer, the tail is discarded. Inside the tissue of a human foot, the little immature fluke forces its way through the layers of cells that make up our flesh. Eventually, it breaks through into a blood vessel and makes its way to a vein where it'll change again, this time into a mature fluke. Blood in the urine is a sign that one type of schistosome has found its home in the bladder wall. Whole villages are tested for the schistosome. The flukes and their eggs cause terrible damage to the liver and bladder. They can even cause cancer. A simple test quickly shows the amount of blood in the urine. Each person is weighed in order to decide on an optimum dose of medicine. Another way of controlling the schistosome fluke is to focus on the snails that play such an indispensable role in the fluke's life cycle. Without the snail, the fluke could get no further than the second stage in its five-stage life cycle. In China, people were sent on organized snail hunts in an effort to halt the disease. Another method involves spraying the waterways where they're found with a chemical deadly to the snail. Schistosomiasis, or bilharzia, while treatable if caught early, is still responsible for a huge amount of suffering around the world. And the schistosome fluke will keep us company for many years to come. While some parasites can be controlled or even eradicated, others are far more difficult to deal with especially those that use insects as carriers. This is the new face of West Africa, Accra, capital of Ghana. New development and housing and a growing economy has improved people's standard of living and quality of life. Not surprisingly, parasites have also found a way to move into the modern metropolis. Mosquitoes are a preferred form of transport. They pick up our parasites from our blood and pass them on at a later date to new victims. Disease can spread quickly. These tiny freeloaders are filarial worms. They develop inside the mosquitoes for two weeks and are then passed into an unsuspecting person during its next meal. Months later, they develop into adult worms that are soon producing thousands more tiny worms. This village on the beach in Ghana looks idyllic, a little piece of paradise on the West African coast. But the people here are well aware of the mosquitoes and their devastating cargo. Yet they go about their business and daily lives in spite of the risks. The swelling of limbs is especially noticeable. The worms produce millions of microscopic young. Often as many as 23,000 can be found in every milliliter of blood. But the swelling is caused by the adult filarial worms blocking the vessels of the lymphatic system and causing fluid to collect. 
Eventually, the tissue in the limbs loses its natural elasticity and the condition becomes permanent, painful and disfiguring. Once established, nothing can be done. The disease, for obvious reasons, is called elephantiasis. The disease seems particularly cruel when it strikes the young. She's just 13 years old. She plays an active part in village life and attends school, but will probably never marry because of her condition, a serious setback for a girl in African society. However, elephantiasis hasn't prevented her father from playing a valued role in village life. He's the chief's official spokesman. Wearing ceremonial robes, he attends all the village functions. The filarial worms can cause elephantiasis to occur in female breasts and the male scrotum, as well as the legs and arms. But those conditions can now be treated by surgery. While African society will always find a place for sufferers, the fight against the disease goes on. The reason it spreads so easily is the vast number of mosquitoes that breed in wet and damp areas. Most of the villages have pools of surface water scattered around their boundaries. They provide the ideal conditions. It's impossible for people to avoid mosquitoes. They're everywhere and they have the perfect equipment for spreading disease. The head and biting mouthparts are like a rig drilling for blood. It's only the females that feed on blood, taking their fill quietly and efficiently. The males prefer fruit. But whereas elephantiasis disfigures unlucky individuals, there is a parasite that persecutes whole communities. They have the potential to drive people out of huge areas of land. One parasite in particular, along with its insect carrier, wrought havoc in the 1960s and 70s and turned whole villages into ghost towns. Victims were left disfigured, disabled and blind. The parasite is said to make young people look old and old people look like lizards. Men and women, blinded by the worm, are led to their work in the fields by their children, such as the impact of river blindness. Unlike the mosquito that relies on pools of water, the black fly that spreads river blindness needs fast flowing rivers and streams. Larvae cling to the rocks, filtering food from the water. When they're ready to pupate, the larvae spin protective cocoons and secure themselves to the stones. They will develop inside their silken sanctuaries and soon emerge to play their part in passing on the parasite. The rivers are important to the people who live near them, both for work and play. So when the biting black fly emerge from the water looking for a meal, they don't have far to search. The flies, though small, give a nasty bite and carry some very unpleasant passengers. When the fly bites someone already infected with the disease, hundreds of baby worms are attracted to the wound from under the skin. They enter the fly in its blood meal and are passed on again into the fly's next victim. Inside the human body, they mature and breed. The females produce 2,000 young worms every day and can live for 14 years. It's the young worms that do the damage as they move around under the skin and attack the eyes. This woman is testimony to the damage they cause. 
In her late twenties, she's totally blind. She nevertheless still manages a full day's work. In places like Africa, where communities rely on each other, sufferers miraculously continue to work and play their part in the economic life of a village. Prayer is an important part of life in Ghana. It takes a lot of faith to work in the bush every day under the curse of the disease. She's learned to recognize her crops by touch and works tirelessly to provide for herself and her family. There are many others like this young woman who will never see again. Some of the older people who've been blind for many years still do their best to make a living. A few of them also suffer other hardships caused by the immature worms moving about under the skin. The body develops an allergic reaction causing terrible itching. The skin becomes thick and scaly almost reptilian, and in some parts of the body, may hang uselessly. Work has been going on for many years at centers like this in Khokhoi in eastern Ghana to eliminate river blindness. Caught early, the disease can be halted and the damage limited. But for many, the drug treatment is too little, too late, and their eyes are beyond repair. In this particular case, there is no sensitivity to light at all. Both eyes have been completely destroyed. Another approach is to remove the worms promptly from the body. When mature, the adult breeding worms form tough fibrous nodules below the skin that protect them from the body's natural defenses. The surgical removal of these nodules is a fairly straightforward procedure performed under local anaesthetic. The nodules are later examined to determine the degree of infestation and to calculate the efficacy of any previous drug treatments. The nodules are surprisingly tough and difficult to remove. Once the nodule has been opened up, it's easy to see the writhing mass of worms inside. The battle against river blindness is being fought very successfully. Onchocerciasis, the disease's medical name, has brought people together in the efforts to defeat it. Whole villages gather to learn about the disease and its symptoms. The vital early treatment can then be initiated. Local chiefs have played a major role in the campaign, along with the cooperation of doctors and medical staff. But there's also been a very successful campaign to kill the black fly itself, a campaign which over the years has dramatically reduced the incidence of river blindness. Nevertheless, the parasite still claims many victims every year. Air traffic has been a boon to parasites. Our ever-growing appetite for foreign travel is putting many more of us on the parasite's menu. 
Each year, millions of us travel from countries like the United States and Western Europe to the hotspots in search of some fun, relaxation or business. The truth is that we may pick up a lot more than just a suntan. Parasites are not choosy when it comes to human hosts, and you or I make as good a home for them as anyone in Africa or the tropics. Nor will even the keenest customs officer notice them. Specialist centres like those in London and Atlanta investigate hundreds of cases each year of travellers who've returned with an unexpected and unwanted souvenir. The expertise of their specialist medical staff is called upon to identify the stowaways. Without their expert knowledge, it would be impossible to decide on the best method of dealing with them. It calls for a trained eye. We present the experts with a plethora of parasites every year from all over the world. Some of the most common are the flatworms, the tapeworms and flukes. The big roundworms too are keen to form attachments with travellers. Fortunately, medical services in the more developed countries can deal with most of these problems. There is a parasite, once common in Britain, and only recently eradicated from the United States, that still flourishes dangerously in other parts of the world. It can sometimes be contracted at airports when the mosquito that carries it flies in with returning holidaymakers or visitors from abroad. And if world temperatures continue to rise, it could find itself settling in somewhere near you. Mosquitoes spread a range of diseases as they feed on our blood excreting what they don't need. The combination of mosquito and single-celled parasites is responsible for one of the most deadly diseases on our planet. Malaria is a master parasite. It's killed half the people that have ever lived on Earth. Today, it kills three million people every year. The parasite claims the life of a child every 30 seconds. The little black dots are the parasite itself, living inside the red blood cells. It's a minute killer, but more deadly than the biggest cats, the largest crocodiles, or the most poisonous of snakes. Malaria was a mystery. No one knew where it came from or how it passed from victim to victim. The word itself means bad air. And years ago, people thought that the damp, foul stench around swamps caused the disease. It wasn't until 1880 that the real culprit was found, with its carrier, the female Anopheles mosquito, identified shortly afterwards. Only the females spread the disease, for only the females feed on blood. Mosquitoes rely on pools and puddles to breed. Their larvae feed voraciously in the water. then turn into pupae and emerge as adults. One small pool can harbour thousands of mosquitoes. The battle to control malaria has been waged for decades. Houses were sprayed with insecticide to kill the mosquitoes. At first, DDT was seen as a major breakthrough in mosquito control. Chemicals were sprayed copiously over whole villages with apparently beneficial results. Vast areas of land were sprayed from the air. And during the 1950s and 60s, people were predicting the global eradication of malaria. It was not to be. The bark of the chinchona tree provided the drug which is still the most effective against malaria. 
and we've been using it since the 1600s. It was called Jesuit powder after the people who brought it to Europe from South America. The substance is now known as quinine. By the 1920s, a synthetic form of quinine was being mass-produced. During World War II, a new drug appeared. It turned the skin yellow and caused temporary insanity, but that was still better than dying slowly of malaria. Then a wonder drug was discovered, chloroquine, the one the world had been waiting for. It saved countless millions of lives, but before long it became ineffective against the worst forms of malaria. The drug had been used too often and some of the malaria parasites had survived it. They passed their immunity on to subsequent generations. Many of the victims are young children from areas of the world where drug-resistant strains of malaria pose a real danger. It's often alleged that drug companies take more interest in the big profits to be made from pet medicines rather than in the investment required to develop anti-malarial drugs for third world countries who can't pay for them. But that situation is changing. While quinine-based drugs are still the most effective, the search is now on for new drugs to kill the malaria parasite. One such drug in use today is mefloquine. So far, it's proving very effective, even against drug-resistant forms of the disease. There are four types of malaria parasite, each one with 12 distinct stages in its life cycle, some of which take place in the mosquito, others inside the human host. Once there, they move from the blood to the liver. Then, after a few days, they enter into our red blood cells. Eventually, they mature. They break out again in waves, causing the familiar malarial tremors. At present, the best hope for progress lies in a 2,000-year-old Chinese remedy. Well known for their traditional approach to medicine, the Chinese have been producing a drug from a very common plant. Qing Hao Su is effective against malaria in combination with other drugs, but the synthetic form isn't yet widely available. The race is on to find not only new ways to treat malaria, but also for a vaccine against the disease, the holy grail of malaria research. The hope is that the next generation may live in a world without malaria. But the parasites are ingenious, highly adaptive creatures that will do their best to stay one step ahead of our efforts. Many other parasites too, like elephantiasis, may well have the opportunity to capitalize on our mistakes. As the Earth's climate gets warmer and we travel ever further and faster, the world for us and our parasites is getting smaller. Diseases like river blindness are responding well to control measures. And it's possible that guinea worm may soon become a thing of the past. But other parasites are never far away. Unseen by us, they're on our pets, in our carpets, in our mattresses, and in us. There are plenty of them out there, awaiting their chance to move into a desirable residence. You. At every opportunity, they'll be eating us alive.